So I had a lot, a lot of robberies. Here in Baltimore, they had a state's attorney, and I don't want to call his name right now, but the state's attorney offered me a 500 years uh, plea agreement, 500 years. You know, they say if I take everything to court, if we take everything to court, they would give me 1,180 years prison sentence. So I didn't believe that. So, and I definitely didn't want to take a 500, you know, year sentence. So I started fighting in court. A lot of things that I got found guilty for, a lot of things that were put on staff, a lot of things that were ran together, concurrent, things of that nature. So at the end of my trial, I wound up with a 140 years prison sentence. Yeah. And that would be a day that, uh, that I would never, ever, you know, forget that day, you know. How y'all doing? My name's Lenny. Uh, they call me Lenny. Uh, I'm just being released from prison after serving 43 years, nine months. Uh, I first went to prison in March 21st, uh, a day that I'll never forget, March 21st, 1979. I was just turning 19. Just turning 19. This is going to be kind of, this trip here is going to be a little emotional for me. You know, so, uh, and as I think back to that day, March 21st, 79, water started, you know, forming the miles already, man, and we haven't even got into it, you know, about my flight, you know, so uh, it's going to be a little bit emotional for me. A lot of pain, you know, so. Uh, uh, you know, share with us what would lead to you getting incarcerated. I became addicted to drugs, to hard drug, cocaine, you know, when I was at an early age, you know, at age 13, you know, so in order for me to support my habit, my drug addiction, I started committing armed robberies, you know, and then that went on, you know, until I turned 19, you know, because my drug addiction was kept climbing and climbing, you know, so, uh, Going back and think about that, you know, it's kind of painful, man. But it was a journey that it was, I guess, was cut out for me, you know, to get to where I am today. So, but I just can't forget about, you know, how it all began for me with my drug addiction, where it led me, you know. So, and that's where my life of drugs began. And my life of crime began there in order to support my addiction. So I started robbing a lot of establishments. It's not nothing to brag about, you know. I used to rob about maybe five or six establishments every day, every day. And, and there was times when I didn't really need the money. You know, it became, the robbery became addiction on its own, you know. And I got caught up with that. So that continued to, like I said, that I was, you know, 19, you know. And when I look back at now, you know, from one addiction to the next, from the cocaine to the armed robberies, I was, you know, caught up on it, you know, and, uh, and which led me to prison. But my brother, you know, which I had a brother who recently passed, maybe almost two years now, he and I looked alike, you know, identical, you know, although he was three years older than me. You know, so he told me, man, you got to stop that robbery, you know, because when they run down on you, they're going to throw away the key. And uh, what they did, you know, they threw away the key for real. But uh, God had all the plans for me, you know, so I sold my guns, you know, because I was going to stop. That was my intentions, you know, and stop. But addiction, with what addiction, you know, talk about the robbery, it wasn't like I could just stop, you know. I had to go through certain things. So not knowing that at that time, you know, that I just couldn't stop robbery. So I sold my guns and then when that craving came for me to rob again, I went and bought me uh, two big knives. And I continued my journey of robbery. And the thing that I uh, regret about it the most, uh, you know, uh, I robbed the house of God, you know. And as uh, 
is one of the things that I still think about today, you know. Not only did I rob, you know, one church, but I robbed four churches. That's something mentally that I'm still dealing with today because I know that uh, if I didn't have a drug addiction, you know, I would never ever have did something like that. For that, you know, very act, I still haven't forgave myself today. That is one of the things that I am still, you know, uh, fighting, you know, mentally wise. You know, I go to therapies about, you know, things that happened during my period of incarceration, things that I've done, things that I haven't forgave myself for. You know, and it's, uh, it's real, you know, it's very real. Can you tell us about getting locked up and receiving your sentence and then going to prison? Well, like I say, my, uh, when they, well, my cousin, you know, this how I got locked, my cousin, you know, turned me in for, they had a thousand dollar reward. I don't know whether he got that or not, but I come to find out that he's the one that turned me in, you know, so when they ran down on me. Uh, here in Baltimore, they had, I had a lot, a lot of robberies. Here in Baltimore, they had a state's attorney, and I don't want to call his name right now, but the state's attorney offered me a 500 years uh, plea agreement, 500 years. You know, they say if I take everything to court, if we take everything to court, they would give me 1,180 years prison sentence. So I didn't believe that. So, and I definitely didn't want to take a 500, you know, year sentence. So I started fighting in court. A lot of things that got found guilty for, a lot of things that were put on staff, a lot of things that were ran together concurrent, things of that nature. So at the end of my trial, I wound up with a 140 years prison sentence. Yeah. And that would be a day that uh that I would never ever, you know, forget that day, you know. How I felt. And then looking back over at my support system, which was my mother, my father, a few brothers and sisters who came to the court with me at that time, you know, uh, to support me. And then when I was sentenced, you know, when I looked back and I seen the look in our eyes, you know, and that's, uh, that was how, you know, it was, you know, so. Like I said, I got locked up in 79 after everything was done. I was, uh, everything was done in 1985. Everything was done, you know, all of my trials. And so, so you spent six years going to court. Back and forth. You know, a lot of postponements, a lot of, uh, People didn't show a lot of the witnesses didn't show up. It was so much happening, you know, so. But during all that, I was, uh, you know, uh, sentenced uh, into uh, Maryland Penitentiary during that period of time because I was already sentenced, you know, to some. So, so back and forth, back and forth, of course. Do you remember the first prison that you went to and what it was like when you got there? Well, I was, uh, my first prison, well, it was a detention center, was Towson Detention Center, and from Towson Detention Center, went to the Maryland Penitentiary on Fall Street, 954 Fall Street. It called the Greystone, Dock House, and it was dark. Tell us about that place. When you first walk into the place, i never been on a, a plane before in my entire life. But I was told that, you know, once you ride planes or get on an airplane or you're coming off an airplane, how your ears pop. It was like that for me in my experience when the first day that I walked into the Maryland Penitentiary. It was so much noise. People talking, people radios, people TVs and it all was mumbled together. It was a day that I would never forget walking down those steps. It was a new world, you know. 
and I knew that I had to become adapted to it. So right then and there, my all of my feelings and emotions that I had, I had to cut them off. But now it's hard today to identify with cutting those feelings and emotions back on after so many years in prison, man. You know, uh, it was miserable. It was a miserable day. When I got to the bottom of the last step, humiliating, going through the script process before you go into your tear area. Literally, you had to bend over, spread your cheeks and cough. And another man is doing that. You get sentenced to 148 years in prison. Here in the state of Maryland and back during this time, was there a certain amount of time that you had to serve before you could become eligible for parole? No, because people was going up for parole. It wasn't a certain amount of time, but uh, people was going up for parole like after 15, 20 years. But with my type of sentence that I had, uh, it was 40 years before I went up for my first parole hearing. You know, 40 years, man. And it's amazing what happened that day. But there was so much happened before that. Lenny, you had mentioned that there would be an incident that took place during the time that you served that would cause you to catch some additional time. Yeah. Uh, you no, know, like I said, when I went to prison, I went for you know a lot of robbery because I had a drug addiction. You know, and then when I got to prison, you know, uh, I couldn't uh, accept you know the fact of where I was at in the Maryland Penitentiary, how much time I had, you know. And I couldn't accept that, so my drug uh, continued, you know, while I was there. That's how I dealt with, you know, my day to day in there, you know, to getting in and using, you know, and uh, I had ran up a bill there of $1,100 of shooting cocaine in one night. And I couldn't pay this guy, but one lie, you had to tell another lie, and that's what cared to, for me. You know, so in order for me, because I used to get into debts, and you know, my family used to always bail me out when I cried wolf. You know, but this time when I cried wolf, they didn't believe that it really was a wolf. You know, but it was. You know, because I always told them, if you don't get me this money, they're gonna kill me. You know, but this time there really was a wolf, and they didn't believe me. So, uh, like I said, I ran up a bill of uh, eleven hundred dollars in one night shooting cocaine. And uh, the next morning I woke up, I owed this man his money, and they didn't know how I was going to pay him. You know, because my brother had cut me off. He said, I got to take responsibility for myself right now, but he's not going to help me. So I went online to this guy about what I owed him for months. And so he just got tired of me lying, you know, about his money. So he crept up on me uh, one day, you know, when I was coming in from work. I used to work in the laundry, pushing a cart. And then I'd see him on my left. You know, hit me in my mouth with batteries, locking the socks, they call. Knocked all my top teeth out, you know, and he ran. But I, I could identify who he was from the back. I knew who he was. So I went to the family. They sent me out to a John Hopkins hospital, got stitched up. They asked me what happened. I told them I got bowled in the mouth, you know, on the basketball court. I don't know nothing about no basketball, but that's the lie that I gave them because, uh, my intention was, you know, to get him, you know, safe face. <laughs> but I didn't know that uh, the results of saving faith, you know. So I didn't see this guy no more for about 18, 19 months. But I thought he was gone. But I didn't know how he had left with the type of time that he had. So when I seen him, it was, uh, I was with a buddy of mine. It was peer pressure, you know, identified now as being peer pressure. Guy hit me on my shoulder and said, man, ain't that guy that, you know, hit you in your mouth some time ago? He was out in the yard working out, you know, running the yard, jogging. And I said, yeah, so I, I ran back to my building and got my knife, you know, and I waited 
to I thought he was good and tired, you know. So, uh, and then I stepped out on him in the middle of the crack, in the middle of the track. I had anticipated, I had studied people, what they do when people, you know, walk or jump in the middle of a track while somebody is working out. I anticipated exactly what he was going to do. I anticipated him throwing his hand up to keep from running into me. And that's exactly what he did. So when he threw his hands up, you know, I hit him in the chest with a knife, and the knife went all the way down to the handle. And I passed it off. My homeboy went one way, I went down the road. When I hit the officers on the wall, they have his officers on the wall that, you know, monitor yard. So when I heard the officer hollering, get him, get him, I knew they was talking about me, but when I looked over my shoulder, I seen this guy lying on the ground, you know, like he was having seizures. You know, at that very moment, you know, I knew that I had killed that man, you know, so. Uh, he died four, later, four days later, and for that, they gave me additional 30 years on my sentence and 10 years on solitary confinement for it. And when I got to South Wing, I couldn't read, I couldn't write, you know. And being in a cell like uh, 23 hours out of the day, I was literally going crazy, man, you know, because I couldn't deal with it. All I had to do all day long was walk back and forth in a cell. It was so and then I was creating more problems for myself by being so that I personally didn't have nothing to do. I got in other people's conversations, you know, while they was talking, you know, out of the bars. And that's one thing you don't do in another Maryland penitentiary is get in another person's conversation without being invited into it. So I was creating problems for myself. It was so I had to start, find something to do to occupy my thoughts, occupy my mind, and all for me to make it from a day to day basis. So I picked up cock novels, you know, sex books, in order for me to read, to know what's going on with the next chapter. That's how I learned to read. That's how I started asking questions. And when I looked up, I was going to school, sending my work to school. I finally got my eighth grade certificate, which took uh, about two years, a little over, just to get an eighth grade certificate. In order for me to participate in the GED process, you know, I had to get that first. So I got it, you know. And that, that eighth grade certificate was such a big accomplishment for me. Because although I was, uh, before I came to prison, I was going to Falls Park. And I don't know how I made it to the 11th grade, but wound up in prison not being able to read. How did that happen? So my education started there, you know, because I was interested in knowing what happened next. I was learning the reading is fundamental. It was occupying my days over there, you know. It was occupying my mind and to help me. I want to go back to a couple of things, so forgive me if I jump in mm. here. But you mentioned being in solitary, you picked up what kind of books? You said sex books? Sex books were called cock novels, you know. Oh, cock novels. Yeah, cock novels. So what are you yeah. talking about, like the Playboy, the Penthouse? Yeah, like you know, that? little stuff like, oh, they had the little uh, the, the paperback hardback ones, they were even harder than the, the Playboys. Okay. So they're like erotic novels. Yeah, yeah, it was, uh, yeah. So that was actually, you trying to read those was a part of how you started learning yeah, how to read. Yeah, but it also, when I really, you know, examined, when I look back and take inventory of myself while I was there on lockup, right, you know, being away from that better, better part of me, those uh, desires of uh, being away from the women, you know, it stimulated my mind, you know, the things that I was missing about, you know, freedom, you know. And so that came a part of my life as well. But it taught me, you know, it taught me a lot. You know, it taught me to start, you know, reading, start me on my educational journey. And when I look back, it really did. That's where it began that for me, as far as my education, you know.
you know, uh, that part of my life, uh, you know, when I look back on it, I thank God for it. I don't know. It was a blessing. Lenny, I want to ask you another thing that you had talked about. You said jumping into other people's conversations while you were back in isolation caused more problems for you. Could you tell us about the problems that that caused for you? You know, uh, there's no, first of all, like I said, when I went over there, you know, I was on a status of a red tag, you know, which means the red tag, which means that you have to walk at a section, you know, of the tier, not unless you go outside, you know. If you go outside, they put you literally a uh, dog kennel. And you go out there for your, your hour walk, you know, out in the dog kennel, you know. But in the days that I don't go out for a walk for the hour, you know, Ben's don't I have nothing to occupy my mind. I always, you know, interfere with other people's conversation. They may be playing chess. They may be talking about their home girls or whatever. And I blunt straight into, you know, their conversation without being invited in. And then that created a problem for me physically and a lot of mental, you know, a lot of arguments about being in somebody else's conversation. And then that carries, that conversation carries on to whenever they can get to you or whenever you can get to them. It's little things like that, uh, things of having the officer take your food away from you because they, they homeboys or homegirls, they tell them don't feed this motherfucker and all this kind of, it's just great a lot of other stuff, you know. So uh, that was a, a teaching and a lesson in itself, you know, for me. Yeah, which it only made me, uh, you know, uh, be aware of exactly where I was at, you know, in the Maryland Penitentiary. You know, so that was a lesson in itself. Lenny, talk to us about when you learned how to read and write and the cell partner that you had that actually helped you with that. Well, after, like I said, after spending, you know, the time of, uh, uh, you know, South Wing, you know, on confinement, you know, the things that I had accomplished while I was over there, you know, I wasn't into, you know, we, and where a lot of people throwing urine and feces on the officers or things like that. That wasn't my type of stuff. You know, so when I started to read and I started to educate myself, like I said, I, I, I got my eighth grade certificate and I enrolled into the GED program, you know, and I got my GED as well while I was over there, you know, on lockup, you know, and, uh, so, but I wanted better, you know. I wanted bit something better, you know. So I hadn't a ticket. I hadn't got a ticket since my. I never got a ticket while I was over there, you know. A ticket adjustment, you know. And I had wrote the warden of the institution and informed him what I had done, you know, while I was over there that I didn't receive any infraction or any tickets, you know. Give me permission to come out to the general population because I wanted to go to college, you know. And you can't go to college while you're on lockup, you know what I'm saying? Because the teachers, the professors come in. So he said, and he responded back saying, if I give him another year over there without any infraction, he would consider, you know, letting me back out to the general population. You know, so I gave him another year without a infraction, and sure enough, he let me out into the general population along with the other inmates, you know. But I found myself still, you know, when it came off like of doing some of the same stuff that they was doing because a lot of people, you know, that I was socializing myself with, a lot of people, you know, that I was hanging out with, you know, was going to literally die in there, you know. A lot of people that have, you know, tripping natural life, four life and all kind of stuff, those are the type of people that I socialized myself with. And I found myself doing some of the same thing they was doing, you know. Until they put me in a cell with a guy, you know. What were some of the same things? If you were I mean, it was a lot of robbery, a lot of, of burning, rioting, all kinds of stabbing. I mean, those are the type of things that, you know what I mean, it kept me going. You know, because, of, like I said, when I, when I first got there from day one, I had to cut those feelings and emotions off. So I found myself some, doing some of the same stuff, you know, what they was doing. But these people... You know, and it's me as well that I thought that that Maryland Penitentiary would be my dying the, the, the burying grounds, but also the guys that I was socializing with, literally some of those people died, you know, in there through the gas chamber while I was, you know, there. Those are the people that I socialized myself with. They literally died in there, so they could be, they, they was doing this stuff, you know. But I never knew, you know, that I was standing up, another chance to be on the outside world today. And so I found myself doing some of the same stuff that they were doing. And my addiction, you know, it was still using, 
you know. You were still using. Yeah, I was still stuff. using. I was still using on a daily basis, you know. And so, and along with my uh, the, 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 my activities, and the, the, the emotions that I, you know, I, I didn't, I don't have to deal with because I drowned them with my drug of choice, you know, and. And that's, that was that was my day to day basis, you know. That was that's that's how I lived. That's how, how easy I lived. was it to get the drugs in there? Hey man, you can get anything in the Maryland Penitentiary you want except an automobile. You know, the officers are bringing in, visitors are bringing in. And I used to work at the at the gym where we had functions, you know, every week, you know, and it comes in like that. People pays me, you know, you know, get their sexual desires off and all that type of stuff. So I kept drugs. The drugs was a problem for me getting in there. You know, it's, it's all kinds of ways to get it in, man. It was it was a, just a daily thing, you know. Daily. What what were you, know? you doing? You mentioned cocaine was your drug yes. choice. Were See, you sniffing it? Were you shooting? No, it? I was shooting it. You know, uh, but the the cocaine, the the powder cocaine wasn't coming in, you know, on a regular basis. But they had some pills that do the same thing as cocaine. They die pills, they call B triple uh B uh, fifty twos. They die pills, you know. But once you take off the pink coating, you coming down to a white pill, you crush that white pill up, you know, crush it up and, and burn it. It's burned just like coke. It gives you the same rush. You know, but it's it, it's uh it, it's really it's powder, you know, and I used to shoot it so much. It had to come out me somewhere, so they started coating out in the corner of my eye, you know. And it that's coming out the, corner of, the corner of my eyes. And from that, I developed glaucoma. What was coming out of the corner of your eyes? Chalk. Chalk? Chalk. From you shooting so from much shoot, of this? From I'm shooting so much of it. Because that's, that's three, four times a day, every day. You even build up in your, uh, uh, in, in, in your arteries, you know. And, uh, but it got to come out. And my eyes was coming out at the corner of my eyes. And develop uh, glaucoma as a result. And that's how I'm dealing with it today as well, you know. So, uh, so. Tell us about the cell partner that you had that helped you learn to read. Well, when I, first, when I first came into this cell, his name was uh, Charles Dutton, you know, Charles Dutton the Rock. And, but he used to talk all that stuff, young boy, I'm going to get me some money one day, you see, you see, young boy, you see, watch. But all he did, he used to work in the bakery, you know. And, and talk about getting money. And talk about getting money. Every time he come from work, he'd take a shower, get everything that he need. Everything that he need. And he had old wooden, I mean, desks, old uh, school desks, whether they fold up or over. he get everything he need. We have our toilet over here, you know. And he's sitting right. At that time, he was writing scripts, you know, right in the corner. You know, the uh, trash man, that was his first was a trash man. And he was writing movies? Yeah, he was writing movies, you know. And he used to tell me, young boy, you watch to see, you got to start getting something on your mind, boy. You got to start getting them something. Start writing. But I didn't know that was about writing, you know. But I tried it. He said, first thing you got to do, you got to get yourself a title. Make it real. You know? So I thought about it, I thought about it. So one day I came out and said, I mean, I want to start writing. He said, what's your title? I said, living outside of the real me. He said, well, I used to say that. I said, because I'm out there day and night hanging out with people, you know, doing all this crazy shit. And I act like it wasn't bothering me. But when I get back in the cell at night, how your soul takes over and feel like my soul was in knots. I was living a lie, man. You know, when I was out there hanging with the boys, you know, I act like the shit that I was doing wasn't affecting me. But when I got back in the cell at nighttime, it hurt, you know. So I titled my first book, Living Outside of the Real Me, you know. And he gave me a lot of support and help on that book. Helped me get it published, you know. And then I really, really took off because I really believe that I can accomplish some things, you know. You get yeah. this first book published. You're in prison when you get this book published. Yeah. They paid right. you to publish this yes. book. Yes, but you know I'm also uh, 
uh, a movie star. <laughs> you know what I mean by that? They uh, they did this uh, this movie, Ice Cube. It's called uh, State of the Union. You know, he, part of it was in film, filmed in the Maryland Penitentiary. And they gave me $500, man, to be an extra in that movie. <laughs> You're in the movie? Yeah, I'm in the movie because the State of the Union, when Ice Cube was escaping, he escaped out of the Maryland Penitentiary by kicking this big fan out. And me, like I said, my job was, you know, working in the, in the auditorium. And so in order for them to come in and set up and everything, I got to get all these big weeks off the floor. So I used to get all these big ass muscle bound guys to do that. So I got around about 20 guys that played extras, you know, out in the yard. Everybody else be locked, was locked down. And so when Ice Cube, you know, escaped out to the penitentiary, you know, by kicking this big fan out the window, helicopter came picking up. We out in the yard hollering, yeah, go, go. They were filming this movie. They brought <laughs> yeah, the helicopter yeah, and everything. Yeah, but that was a stunt man on the helicopter. But when Ice Cube came out the, when he came out the, uh, out the uh, supposed to be escaping, right? Run across the roof of the penitentiary, right? That's when I, but this is real hat for real. The helicopter came in, but stunt man was hanging by legs on the bar, goes towards the top of the very wall. That was a nice cube. That was a, that was a stunt man doing that. Hold on, hold on. Where are you at in this movie? We out, we, we out in the yard, right? We had got our jump out. You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. Hey, I'm gonna go they, watch this. They gave, they gave him five hundred dollars for that, man. They and, gave all y'all Yeah, they gave. Yeah, it was about twenty, twenty-two of us. They gave five hundred dollars a piece to pay that that part, right? And we ate like big dogs, man. I ain't never ate so good in the Maryland Penitentiary in my life, and so. That was uh, three days of filming, man, that uh, I really didn't know that I was in the pen, you know, because I locked everything else out. How long had you been locked up at that point? Uh, at that time, it was about maybe almost 20 years. I'm, I'm not sure, but my mind backed up, man. Yeah, so uh, that was uh, three days that I... I really didn't uh, really, really realize that I was still in the Maryland Penitentiary. Tell us about the book, Living Outside of the Real Me. What is yeah. that book about? Well, I entitled the, the book, you know, Living Outside of the Real Me, you know, because like I said, you know, although I was still out there drugging, you know, a lot of stuff, you know, when I was talking about, you know, cutting my feelings and emotions off, that's what I had to do and uh, when I first came the first day that I came into the penitentiary. You know, living outside the real me is about, you know, me hanging out with people, you know, not realizing, you know, uh, you know what's going on. You know, that I was really living a lie. You know, because I, I didn't want to show that weak side, you know, the people that I was hanging out with, you know. I didn't want to show that side. But like I said, when I got into the you know, cell at night, how my soul, you know, took over, you know, how my soul, my feelings and emotion really came back. You know, it's hard to explain. My feelings and emotions really came back because I was realizing, you know, that the things that I was doing in the day, you know, it wasn't me. It really wasn't me, you know. My true feelings and emotions came at night when I'm locked in the cell with myself or with myself, buddy, you know. So I had to write about those things. So I entitled the book, Living Outside the Real Me, you know. It was because I was living a lie, you know, living a lie. Let's move on to the, the sober time that you had. You had a lot of sober time, 27 years? Yeah, I had 27 years, you know, uh, and what brought that part on with my want to get clean, you know, uh, my mother, you know, she uh, she came to the penitentiary, you know, and tell me that you know she was dying. You know, she had breast cancer. She told me that she was dying, and this the look that I saw on her face the day that I was sentenced. It was somewhat of the same look when she came to the Maryland penitentiary and told me that she was dying of cancer. But she told me that. Her fear was not of her dying, you know. Her fear was of her dying without ever seeing me a free man again. So I made a choice, I made a decision, you know, to do what I can to try to get out before she died 
and I believed that I can get it. I could do it, but the realization was I knew deep down inside that I couldn't. And she died without ever seeing me a free man again, you know, so. Uh, and from that day forward, uh, you know, then my mama writing started picking up. I was being able to think a little bit clearer, you know, on a daily basis. I wasn't socialized with some of the people. You know, I wasn't, you know, so I was away from the drug. And I was hanging out with, you know, people that was, you know, going to school. You know, I don't know what they doing in their past time at night, but during the times that I was with them, they wasn't using it. And so that played, that was a, played a role in my life. It helped me out a lot, you know, so. And then when I started writing, you know, I, uh, I wondered I could, I was able to think clearly, you know, without some type of, you know, drug. And it was a good feeling. And so I just started taking it a day at a time, you know. So I taking it a day at a time. And so I accumulate some clean time, you know, and then uh, my uh, counselor, case manager, you know, said that uh, I was about to go up for parole after 40 years. And I asked her what would her recommendation be. She said, uh, I'm not recommending four or five years set off. I thought, I literally heard, I thought she said, from four to five years set off, which means that I will be coming back up after four years or five years. But then she clarified to say, I said 45 years set off. 45 years? You telling me you're going to recommend me 45 years set off? And you are my case commander? Bitch, you crazy. So that meant that when you went up for yeah. parole and they denied you, that she, her recommendation was you go back up for parole in another 45 years. 45 years. But God had other plans. And I didn't believe. I believed in God. But after robbing the house of God, I had very little confidence in God. After committing a crime of taking a man's life, what is it uh, they're going to do for me for us parole? So a few months passed, they called me up there for parole. And when you go up for parole, you always have victim impact statements. But at that time, nothing was on camera, you know. You could do it in person. So the family of the person that I killed was there to do a victim impact statement on me. They got how they feel, what their views are, you know, and they have uh, opportunity to tell. Which at the time it was a three hearing officer, right? But because I had committed another crime, I had to go in front of four. So the victim family came and gave their victim impact statement, and I can't believe that they talked in my favor. They talked about the love for their loved one, but also they talked in my favor. So they asked me, you know, of all the things that I've done while I was incarcerated, while I was there, of all the robberies that I committed to get there, what is it that you want us to do for you? Is so what I, the victim's family said? No, the hearing officers, that's what they said at that point, you know. But the victim family, you know, they talked in my favor. And when the hearing officers asked my question, what is it that I want them to do for me? And I asked them just to give me another opportunity to prove that I, I'm not that same individual that came into that penitentiary on March 21st, 79. Physically I was, but mentally I have changed. But I just couldn't do it through just mere words. Coming from a person with a fourth grade reading level, you know, I took everything there, you know, from the, my reading level. I got all my documents from school to show them where I was at in my studies in the school. Couldn't read fourth grade reading level to my eighth grade, typically to my GED. 
and to my two books that I have published, you know. And I wrote it down to them, you know. My infraction record, spotless. So they asked me to step out of the room. And I was out there for over three hours waiting on the decision. So when they called me back in, they said, Mr. Taylor, we're going to give you that opportunity. We're going to grant you parole with at least a year delayed release. And I almost fell out. But it went been for the testimony of the victim who life that I took. But I got to give myself a little credit that I had changed. You know, they gave me parole. But they wanted me to have some type of work experience because I had been out of the workforce for over 42, almost 41 years. So they want me to, to make this roundabout to go to pre-release, to work release, to uh, home detention, and then I'm home without an infraction. I did it. And on the day they said they're going to release me, my brother, you know, came to pick me up. And I haven't, not yet to this day, talked to or read something in someone's history regarding serving that much time, robbing the house of God, and making parole on your first time up. I knew, although that I robbed the house of God, he was still carrying me. And he's still carrying me today, you know. But I still get up in my head. I'm still fighting with the addiction. I'm still fighting with me. I'm trying to outrun me. And it's, uh, the struggle is real. But now I'm in college. I graduated from college with a major in the political science. Now I'm back in college again for addiction counseling. <laughs> and I can't figure out what's going on with me. But I'm trying to reach out and help somebody else. And that's my goal.